going live. Hi, everyone. We're going live right now. We have uh, Vicky Cabrera here for our webinar on um, positive capacity building for NGOs. And we're letting people in the room. So we'll start shortly. Um, Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today on positive capacity building for NGOs. We're super excited to have everyone here and we're just uh, letting everyone settle in. Uh, lots of people already here, 71. So if you are in the room, uh, let us know in the chat box where you're all coming from so we have an idea. We have a, we're very privileged to have Vicky here who's dialing in at night um, from LA. So thanks so much, Vicky, for being here. Looks like a lot of people are coming in from um, different parts of the Philippines. And we also have somebody from Pakistan, somebody from Cavite, from Laguna, from Cebu, um, Kevin calling in from Nueva Ecija, and Virgilio from Laguna, Diane from Pasig. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, oops. Looks like a lot of people are coming in from. Today we have our topic is going to be positive capacity building for NGOs. And we are positive workplaces. So our mission is to co-create cultures that enhance the well-being of the Filipino workforce. And I'm Nikki. If you're new here, I'm the Chief Well-Being Officer and the co-founder of Positive Workplaces. And for us, this is how we imagine that we're able to create those positive workplaces. It starts with positivity ripples, you beginning to lead yourself, coming into the session, learning more about uh, positive capacity building, building that knowledge and those skills in you. And then you start to lead others. And together, you're able to lead cultures and you're able to create positive workplaces. So just some reminders before we start, have another device or be ready to go to another link. Vicky has made this session very interactive. She's going to be using Mentimeter. Everyone will be initially on mute, but we'd love to hear your engagement in the chat box. Please let us know your questions, your insights, and um, if you'd like to speak later, you can raise your hand. We will also be sending out an evaluation at the end of this so that you can get your certificate. Please answer the evaluation. It's only open for 30 minutes after the session and make sure to write your full name because that is what will be reflected in your certificate. So we've had an amazing webinar series uh, this month about well-being management for NGO workers. And we're capping it off with Vicky's webinar where she's talking about positive capacity building for NGOs. So I'm, it's such a privilege for me to introduce Vicky to everyone here today. I was, I, we both attended the virtual International Positive Psychology Association World Congress. And so even if we did not physically bump into each other, like they had a chat box there where we could reach out to other participants. And uh, I mean, it, it, it was amazing because Vicky is from LA. She's studying in Claremont, but she's also a Filipina and has been in the Philippines and worked in the Philippines. So she has an amazing story to share. Vicky is an organizational and positive psychology consultant researcher and evaluator. She is passionate about using a science-based approach to bringing out the best in people and organizations focused on social impact. She has more than 18 years of experience with NGOs in both the Philippines and the US and has worked in various roles, including as a program manager, co-founder, consultant, and evaluator. 
Vicky holds an MPA in nonprofit management from New York University and is pursuing a PhD in positive organizational psychology and evaluation at Claremont Graduate University, where she conducts research on well being and positive psychology. She also serves as the president elect of the International Positive Psychology Association's Work and Organizations. Divisions. So I'm very privileged to introduce her to everyone. Um, thanks so much for being with us, Vicky. Thank you so much, Nikki. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. And hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. And I just want to thank Positive Workplaces for hosting me today. I'm very excited to talk to you about positive capacity building. So first, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, and then we will get started. So today I'm going to be sharing with you about positive capacity building. Um, and this is actually a new approach to capacity building for NGOs that I developed based on positive psychology. Now, before I go into it, I did want to share um, a little bit about my journey and why I'm here today. And, um, you know, working with NGOs and doing this webinar for NGO workers in the Philippines is really um, close to my heart. And um, one of the reasons why is because I'm, I'm a Filipino American. I was actually born and raised in the US, as you can probably tell from my accent. But I was lucky enough to make a Balakbayan journey back to the Philippines in 2012, when I was living and working in New York City at the time. Uh, but when I was living in New York, I no longer felt fulfilled with my life there. I was also burned out. So I decided to actually leave and to move to the Philippines with no plan, by the way. Um, and I actually knew very little about the Philippines before I moved there. But I felt a very strong calling in my heart to go there and to spend more time there to connect with my roots because I had felt very disconnected from being Filipino growing up in the US. And a long story short, I ended up working for an NGO in the Philippines, Gawad Kalinga, and I ended up staying in the Philippines for over five, five years. Um, one of the things that I did was I helped to start a school for poor youth in the, in the countryside. And at the time when I was working for the NGO, I was lucky enough to be trained by an American volunteer and expert in positive psychology. So funny enough, positive psychology is a movement that was born in the US like me, but I actually discovered positive psychology in the Philippines. And it ended up being a life-changing experience for me that brought me where I am today, um, where I decided to pursue my PhD. So now I have two homes, um, both the US and the Philippines, which is still very close to my heart. And, you know, during my time in the Philippines, I discovered many things, you know, I discovered my calling in life, what I wanted to do um, in my career. Um, I also discovered my homeland, which I felt disconnected from. Um, and I also discovered two words or concepts that were very new and eye-opening for me at the time. So the first word is kapwa, which uh, for me kind of captures the feeling of kindred spirit that I felt when I met other Filipinos in the Philippines. You know, it's kind of amazing. I would meet strangers, but I felt this like strong sense of connection with them. And this is, was a unique feeling I had never experienced before I moved to the Philippines. And I couldn't find, this, find a way to describe this feeling until someone taught me this word, um, which is from Filipino psychology and has no English equivalent. And the second word is bayanihan, which I know you are all very well familiar with, but this was also a very completely new, new concept for me at the time. And you know, these 
these two words or these two values, they're very uniquely Filipino. And, you know, I was also very lucky enough to experience both of these things when I was doing NGO work in the Philippines. Um, it was very inspiring. I was felt like I was part of a community of people who were working together, you know, to help their Filipino, fellow Filipinos, to help the country. And, you know, I know that we don't always see these two words in action. Um, in the Philippines, right? You know, you look at the news, there's bad news, you hear stories of corruption. Um, so, uh, you know, to some degree, it feels like these Filipino values have been maybe forgotten or lost. But in my work, which is in positive psychology, I'm very interested in focusing on people's strengths. And I know that when you focus on people's strengths, there's great power and potential when you unlock those strengths. And it's great to be able to use those strengths as much as possible. And I also experienced both of these values firsthand when I was doing NG work, NGO work in the Philippines. So to me, these two words capture um, the strengths of the Philippines that you know, I choose to focus on and that I would like to help develop in my work. And um, I'm imagining that it's the same for you as well in the work that you do for your NGOs, which is very challenging, mission-based work, um, so again, this is just why I'm very happy to be here with you today. And I hope that what I share with you today um, can be helpful for you because I understand that your work is um, very important, but also uh, can be very challenging. And here is what we'll cover today. So I'm guessing the number one question you have is what is positive capacity building? So I will definitely explain what that is. I'll also talk about why I think it's important for NGOs and how can you use positive capacity building to create positive change in your organization so that you can improve your effectiveness and grow your social impact. That is the goal. So my goal for you today is to be able to walk away with some very simple, practical, uh, but effective tools that you can start using right away. So, what is positive capacity building? And why do we need a positive approach to capacity building? So I imagine that most of you are familiar with what capacity building is. Um, I know a number of you are joining from the Association of Foundations, and I know it's a big area of focus for the association. Um, but basically, capa capacity building is something that's specific to mission-driven organizations like NGOs. And it's basically doing whatever is needed to improve the organization's effectiveness with the goal of growing your social impact and ensuring your sustainability as an organization. So it's called capacity building because it involves increasing an NGO's capacity to be able to you know, help more people, help more beneficiaries, or create a bigger impact in the community, for example. And ideally, capacity building is not a one-time initiative. It's an ongoing process of continual improvement that an NGO engages in um, to grow their impact, um, but also to ensure that this impact is sustainable over the long term. Now, the traditional approach to capacity building work, in my opinion, has been more focused on fixing problems and weaknesses, you know, with the assumption that if you want to improve things and grow your impact, you know, we have to fix the issues. Um, and oftentimes, um, in traditional capacity building is focused on improvements that are operational, programmatic, and financial. But what I am proposing is a new approach to capacity building that is a positive approach. So what do I mean by that? Um, so in the positive capacity building approach, the focus is on identifying the strengths of the organization instead of the problems and weaknesses and building on those strengths in order to build the capacity of the organization. And in addition to building the capacity of the organization, it also focuses on building the capacity of people. And it does this by building psychological and social resources, as well as creating a positive work environment, which I feel is extremely important in order to help support the well being of staff, as well as to energize work performance. So positive capacity building is an ongoing process of improvement. Um, and in addition, it 
also used as evaluation to get feedback on these improvements, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And, you know, I think that the people aspect of capacity building is especially important. Um, so in addition to improving organizational effectiveness, it focuses on supporting staff well-being and energizing their focus um, by building their and meeting their psychological needs. And I think, you know, unfortunately, the people aspect um, of capacity building and even, you know, day-to-day -day work at NGOs can sometimes be neglected and over overlooked just because, you know, maybe you're so busy, um, you know, there's so much work to be done. Um, and I also understand that the work can be sometimes challenging and, stre and stressful, especially during these times. So, you know, I believe that this is why I believe that NGOs can really benefit from a positive strengths based approach to capacity building that's based on science in order to help you grow your social impact and ensure sustainability. So now we will get into how you can use positive capacity building to create positive change in your organization that will grow your social impact. And as I mentioned, we'll focus both on change for the organization itself and what you do, as well as um, building the resources of people. And more specifically, ooh, <laughs> I will be giving you six tools that you can use for positive capacity building. So the first tool, is called Connect With Why. So before we get into it, I would like for you to go to menti.com and I'd like for you to answer this question, what is the positive impact you want to have in the world? And I'll give you a minute, oops, one second. There you go. Um, so what is the positive impact you want to have in the world? You can take a minute to think about it and just um, submit your answers on menti.com. Empowerment that creates ripples of change. Excellent. What about others? You know, why did you why did you join your NGO? Um, you know, what, what inspires you um, about sort of the change or impact you'd like to have? Changing lives, great. Peace, wonderful. Treating people with kindness, excellent. Very needed nowadays, for sure. Happiness, resiliency, inspiring the younger generation, wonderful. Supporting students, safe spaces, accessible and quality education. Excellent. So thank you very much for sharing. Um, I just wanted to kind of get a sense of, you know, what is bringing people here and what brings them to the work that they do. One second. So the question that I ask you, it relates to the idea of purpose. So what is purpose? Having a purpose means having a goal for your life, but it's not just any kind of goal. It's actually um, bigger than a goal that's just for yourself. It's a goal that inspires you to make a difference in the world. Um, and it's something that you can work towards your entire life. It gives you direction in life. And also it's something that's very meaningful to you. So for example, you know, I think you gave some great examples of purpose just now. Um, your life's purpose could be to empower other people or to lift them out of poverty. Um, and you know, there are also a variety of different ways that you can live out that purpose. Uh, so another way to think about your life's purpose is your why. So for NGO workers or anyone who's doing mission-driven work, I think your personal why is especially important because um, I think it's often what draws people to the mission of the NGOs, which you can think of as the organization's why. And ideally um, you join or you are able to see a connection between the two, um, between your why and the why of the NGO. And this connection helps motivate you to take action. It's kind of like fuel that gives you energy to do the hard work that needs to be done to achieve that mission. So that's why for the work that you do, I think it's important to stay connected 
to your why, as well as to the why of the organization. And also to remember that you're not alone. You know, at your NGO, you're part of a team, a community of people who are also there because of their whys. And that's something that you have in common. So I also think it's good to know, you know, what inspires the other people on your team to do their best work and to make those connections as well. And when you do this, there's a lot of energy and inspiration that this can create when you kind of make these connections between your why, the why of others, and the why of your NGO. But, you know, sometimes these connections can get lost. Um, you know, you're very busy. Um, you know, there are challenges, you're kind of in the day to day work, the weeds, the tasks, and you kind of lose sense of the bigger picture, and there is a disconnection. Um, but I think it's important in your day to day work that your day to day work is meaningful and that you can, you have a sense of how your the, the tasks that you do each day connect to your why and the bigger why. So that's why I think it's important to maintain those connections. And I think this is an important aspect of capacity building, um, because it's an important psychological resource for people to be connected to their why. So I just wanted to share with you just an example of an exercise um, that I developed that you can do with your team. This can be like a team building exercise. Um, and the goal is to help you make those connections between your why, the why of the organization, and the why of others. So it starts off with reflection on your own, where you connect with your own purpose through writing your own personal mission statement. And then you write a story about a time that you live the statement at work to make that connection to work. And you also draw a visual of the impact that you want to have in the world. And then once you do that, um, you share with others, this could be in your teams or in pairs, other coworkers, um, you know, to share around, you know, your own personal whys and, you know, sort of why you're there in the organization. And then finally, um, the last part is reflecting on what the NGO's mission and vision means to you, how it connects to your own purpose, and together, what is the desired impact that you want to co-create together? Um, and ideally, writing some sort of statement together or creating a visual. Um, so again, this exercise is really geared towards helping you stay connected to your purpose and your why, which will help fuel and energize not only your well-being, but also your work performance. So that's the first tool. The next, so the next tool I'm going to share with you is a tool that you can use for the capacity building work itself. And it's called appreciative inquiry. So appreciative inquiry is a collaborative strengths-based approach to change. It's a tool that you can use to identify strengths, strengths at work in other people, in your team, your program, or your organization. And the idea is that once you discover these strengths, you can build on those strengths in order to build the capacity of your NGO. So, you know, to appreciate means to recognize and to value the very best in people and the organization, rather than focusing on their weaknesses or problems. And to inquire means to ask questions. And this is what appreciative inquiry is all about. It's about asking questions. But the goal of asking these questions is to explore and discover strengths, potential, and new possibilities in your organization, in the people around you, um, and to create change starts with asking these kinds of questions, um, starting with identifying the strengths so you can build on the strengths. So how do you use appreciative inquiry? Well, there are actually several ways that you can use appreciative inquiry, but today for this webinar, I'm going to focus on the easiest and simple way, simplest way to use it. And that is simply by asking questions. Um, but it's not about asking any type of question. Um, it's important to ask appreciative questions. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that means. Um, but basically appreciative questions are positively framed questions as opposed to problem focused questions. And for capacity building, your goal is to ask questions in order to discover the strengths, the successes and new potential and possibilities for your NGO or for your programs so that you can grow your social impact. And you know, the wording of these questions is very important. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. 
So what do I mean by appreciative questions? Let's look at some examples. So first, here are some more maybe typical questions you might hear at work when it comes to thinking about change or trying to make improvements. Um, and as you can see, the way that these questions are worded up, you know, what do I want less of? What should I stop? What do I want to remove? What can I prevent? You know, they're a little bit more on focused on identifying and fixing problems. But we can actually reframe these questions to be more appreciative into appreciative questions. So for example, instead of what you, asking, what do I want less of, you could ask, what do I want more of? You know, what should I start instead of stop? What do I want to create? Or what can I support? So these are just some examples of appreciative questions. And again, the goal here is to ask questions that will help you to discover strengths, successes, potential, and possibilities. So using appreciative inquiry is just a matter of reframing the questions you ask at work to be more appreciative. So here are a few more examples of some appreciative questions, but you can come up with your own. So um, for capacity building, you know, something you can ask is, you know, what has gone well? What can we create more of? in the future? What are our strengths? How can we use our strengths as an NGO, as a team, as a program to grow our social impact even more? Um, and another example, what did our beneficiaries value from their experience with us that we can do even more of? So again, it's just about asking questions and it's actually quite simple to use. You can start changing the questions you use at work tomorrow um, simply by framing them to be more appreciative instead of problem focused. So I wanted to give a try to see if we could maybe practice a little bit. So I wanted to, you to think about just one example and you know, just give it a try um, whether you can think of what is one appreciative question that you can ask at work. I'm gonna go, go to menti.com and see if you can think of an appreciative question and I'm going to switch to show you the responses. So what is one appreciative question you can ask at work? Can you think of any ideas? Maybe it would help if you think about a typical question you might ask at work and how you can reframe it to focus more on strengths. I'll give it a minute. So remember, appreciative questions are positively framed questions. What do we do that makes us happy at work? Love it. What do you feel right now? Is there anything I can do to help you? Love that as well. These are great appreciative questions. Any other ideas? And I think you can see, you know, the way that they're worded, they're really about getting at the strengths and the positivity. Um, what would make you happy to do for others? Excellent. How can we assist you? Nice. So yeah, I think these are all great. What are our goals for today? How is everyone? Have we taken your break yet? <laughs> so some of these questions, I think, um, you know, you can, uh, for example, you know, what are our goals for today? I think that's a, a good question, but to make it more um, appreciative, I think it could be maybe a little bit more specific um, where you could perhaps ask for goals, um, specific types of goals um, that might focus on what you can do more of, um, you know, what, based on your successes or your strengths. Um, but I think these are great examples of appreciative questions. And you can, you know, keep practicing. Um, and there are, again, many different appreciative questions that you can use. I'm gonna go back. Oops, sorry. There we go. So how can you use appreciative inquiry for capacity building? Um, so what you can do is first, it helps to start by identifying what is the focus of your capacity building? Where do you want to grow your social impact? Is it for a specific program? Is it for the NGO as a whole? That will help kind of focus what kind of questions you should ask. And then you can ask appreciative questions. This can take the form of like perhaps a brainstorming session with your team, for example. Um, and again, the goal of the questions that you ask is to try to uncover and discover the strengths um, of your program or of your organization. 
And next, after you've discovered and identified those strengths, you can then brainstorm as a team, you know, how can you leverage and build on these strengths in order to grow your social impact? And then once you've identified some strategies, um, it's nice to be able to kind of create a more specific vision and to set goals for what, you're, for what you're trying to achieve in the future. And then to simply plan on how you're going to get there as well as implement the plans. So this is one way that you could use appreciative inquiry for capacity building. But it could also be just as simple as simply starting to change the questions that you use at work. And there are a number of benefits to this approach, um, especially when it comes to organizational change and capacity building. So I think the benefits are that, you know, the, the process itself of answering these questions, of having these discussions creates more positive emotions, which helps to motivate and energize. Um, this can be a lot more inspiring than when you are discussing problems, for example. And, you know, there's a lot of research that shows that um, experiencing more positive emotions actually sparks more creativity and innovation. And, you know, it also focuses on building on strengths. Um, I think it makes sense to focus on strengths in order to bring out the full potential of the organization and maybe it'll help you see possibilities that you wouldn't have seen before. So if you are interested in Appreciative Inquiry and you want to learn more, this is a great website. They have a ton of resources, including example questions that you can use. And I highly recommend that you go there and check it out to learn more about how you can use Appreciative Inquiry. So that is your second tool, Appreciative Inquiry. So the next tool I'm going to talk about focuses specifically on building your psychological resources. And this tool is called your inner hero. So what is your inner hero? Um, so actually this tool is kind of like a four and one. So as you can see, hero is an acronym that stands for hope, efficacy, resilience, and optimism. And these are things that you can think of as sort of like positive states of mind. And you know, when these four um, psychological resources are together, um, it's known as something called psychological capital. Um, so psychological capital is a very well researched in organizations and it's been found that having more of all of these four things, more psychological capital, um, it's been found to contribute to a lot of positive outcomes for people at work, including a positive effect on well-being and also improving work performance. And these positive outcomes have been found across different cultures, including the Philippines. So you could think of these as four separate tools, but I want you to think about all four of them together as one tool because research has also found that having, while having any one of these will be great and beneficial for you, having all four of these will have even greater benefits when you have them all together. And for NGO workers, um, because of the challenges that you face in the work that you do, especially during this pandemic, which has brought challenges to a whole other level um, for NGOs and for people at work, you know, I think that having and building your hope, your efficacy, your resilience, and your optimism is actually critical. And I think especially during these times. And the good news is that these are simple school skills. Um, there are simple skills that you can learn to develop more hope, efficacy, resilience, and optimism in yourself and in others, and so that you can experience all of the benefits. So I'm going to go into each one to explain how. So first I'm going to talk about hope. So I think everyone is familiar with the feeling of being hopeful, um, but what is hope exactly? And hope is your ability to work towards desired goals, and to succeed in reaching that goal. So if you want to be more hopeful and you want to build more hope in yourself, it's actually quite simple. You need to have uh, clear goals in the first place that you're trying to achieve. So in the workplace, ideally you have clear goals for your work, but just not, not um, having goals is not enough. Um, in order to feel hopeful about reaching that goal, you also need to see a clear path to get there. And what you need is to also create a plan for how you're going to work towards your goals. And that is how you build hope. And I think it's important for the goals that you set to be very clear. So you may have heard of this acronym for SMART goals. So SMART 
stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based. So ideally, your goals are very um, specific so that they're detailed and meaningful to you, that there's something you're able to measure so that you can track progress, that they're realistically achievable, that they're relevant to what you're trying to achieve at work, and that they're time-based, that there's some sort of you know, clear deadline or time around when you'll do these goals. So here are just some examples um, of what it means to have a smart girl, not smart, not a smart goal um, versus a smart goal. So you can see here um, with the examples, the goals that aren't smart are not very detailed. They're quite vague. Um, so in order to make them a smart goal, um, you make them more specific. So for example, if you have a personal goal of being more physically active, just saying that is not enough. Ideally, you want your goal to be specific, something like I will exercise for 30 minutes, two to three times a week. Um, so that is an example of what it means to have a SMART goal. So I thought that maybe we could practice again a little bit. And the question I have for you now is, what is one SMART goal that you can set for yourself. So we're gonna practice writing SMART goals. So what is one SMART goal that you can set for yourself? Can you think of any examples of a SMART goal? And don't worry, it's confidential, so we can't see <laughs> who's, who's writing the goals, um, but the goal is more just to practice um, writing specific goals. So can you think of an example of a goal that you want to set for yourself that's specific? Sleep nine hours a day, excellent. I think that's a great SMART goal. Um, you're very specific with the time and that you want to do it every day and exactly what you want to do. So that would also be something that's, you know, very easy to measure, very easy to track to see if you're being successful. Finish your task on time. I think that's a good start, finish my task on time, but I would even um, suggest making the on time part more specific, like giving yourself a specific deadline. Learn a new word every day. That is also a nice SMART goal. Relevant. I think there should be a little bit maybe more detail in that goal, but I think that's a great start. So yeah, I think, you know, I think you guys are getting the hang of it. Excellent, bike 10 kilometers a day by the end of the month. So these are some examples of how you can write your goals um, to be more SMART. Excellent. I'm seeing some great examples now as well. Let me go back. So once you have set clear SMART goals, the next step is to create a plan to reach those goals. And this plan should include exactly what actions do you want to take towards those goals? And when will you take these actions? So again, it helps to be specific. So here's an example of a template that you can use, but you might have your own system, your own tools that you use for planning. Um, but basically the idea is that it's important or it will be more effective if you write your plan down. Um, and that to also remember that, you know, even though you're writing it down, it's also flexible and can change as things happen. So you can also revisit it and update it as needed. But basically the idea of um, with hope and to build more hope is that you want to have, you know, goals, ideally smart goals, and then a clear plan or a clear path to get there. And when you do that, that helps build hope at work. So next I'm going to talk about efficacy. So it's also known as self-efficacy and um, self-efficacy is a, it's about confidence, it's, but it's a specific type of confidence. It's your confidence in your ability to succeed at a specific task. Um, so for example, when you're faced with a task or a project at work, you know, of course, you need the skills to be able to, or the information, the resources to be able to do that work. But another important part of being successful is also the belief in yourself, the belief that you will be able to accomplish what you're setting out to do. And that type of confidence is known as self-efficacy. Um, but the good news, like hope, is that you can build your self-efficacy. And I'll give you some example of three ways that you can do it. Um, the first is to have mastery experiences. So experiences where you're successful, and this can take the place of small wins. They don't have to be like huge successes. Um, another thing that helps is encouragement. You know, when we receive encouragement from others, that can help build our confidence and our self-efficacy. 
And then also having a role model. Um, when you see someone else who has accomplished what you're trying to accomplish, that will also increase your, con com your confidence in succeeding in that task. So I'm gonna share just a very simple exercise with you um, to help build your, your um, self-efficacy, which is to write down your small wins and accomplishments. And ideally, I think it's nice to do this each day. Um, and by doing this, it will help to give you a sense of progress, um, progress towards the goals that you're trying to achieve. You know, sometimes we don't make that connection about what we're doing or we, we don't um, recognize or celebrate our small wins enough and then we don't feel like we're making any progress. So writing down your small wins can actually really help build your self-efficacy. And here are just a few examples of small wins. And they can be, you know, they don't, again, they don't have to be huge. Any type of progress can be a small win, completing a task, overcoming a challenge, learning something new. So I wanna take the time again to practice a bit. And I want you to answer this question. What is one small win that you achieved recently? So I'm going to switch over to take, so we can take a look at your responses. So what is one small win that you achieved recently? And it can be personal, it can be at work, it can be anything. And again, you know, it can be something small, woke up at 6 a.m. I think that's definitely a win for sure on time, it's very early. Getting professional help for mental health, that's great. That is definitely a win for sure. Helping someone, acing an interview, Eating more vegetables, love that one. Enrolled in graduate school, nice. Finished a book, preparing for an event. Finishing a task on time, that is also a win. Helping your child, fully vaccinated, nice. These are great examples of small wins. So, you know, this can help give you some idea, um, you know, it, and you can see it doesn't take much time. So taking the time to, you know, write down your small wins every day can be, very um, energizing and helpful for you, especially at work. So that is self-efficacy. Now next, I'm going to talk about resilience. And resilience is the ability to bounce back or overcome challenges. And I think this is especially important for NGO workers, given the nature of your work. Um, which can often come with challenges, but I'd say it's even especially critical now during this time of dealing with COVID. But again, luckily, we can build strategies and use skills to become more resilient over time. So I just have a quick question for you. Um, think of a challenge that you experienced recently. How did you overcome your challenge? So you don't have to share the challenge, but I want to know you know, what helped you to overcome or bounce back from this challenge? So it can be any type of challenge, um, maybe ideally a challenge at work. You reached out for help, excellent. That's definitely a great strategy. And I will talk about that in a moment. Motivating yourself by imagining the team goal, asking for help, talking with the team. There's a lot of asking for help here and that's, um, that's great. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. Had a consultation, excellent. So I think there's already a lot of resilience with the, with the group um, that's with us today at this webinar. And as you can see, when you think about it, you probably have already developed a number of different skills or strategies to help you become more resilient. Now, I'm just gonna share um, a few more um, ways to, that other ways that you can help build resilience. So there are a number of ways to build resilience. Um, and, you know, part of that is there are skills that you can use to, um, and learn and use to build resilience, but then your environment, is also an important factor. Um, so having social support, which actually a lot number of you talked about, um, I'm not surprised because that has actually been found to be um, an important buffer 
that protects us when we experience challenges and really helps us um, to bounce back from challenges. So social support is critical. So I'm gonna go into um, some of the skills. So the first skill is called reframing. And um, basically this is something that you can do when you encounter a challenge. So when you experience a challenge, the idea with reframing is that you just find a new way to look at the situation. And you do that by focusing on what you can control as opposed to what you can't control. You know, every situation has things that you can't control, but try to find what you can control in the situation. And then next, ask yourself, what is the most helpful way to look at the situation? Is there an opportunity in here that I could potentially pursue? Next is to brainstorm some potential actions that you can take to try to achieve the best possible outcome for this scenario. And then finally, once you've identified some ideas and strategies to create a realistic plan to implement those strategies. And again, you can use the plan that I shared earlier, the same template for building hope. So you may notice that there's actually a lot of overlap between all of these different elements of SciCap. Um, so the nice thing is that when you are building resilience, you can also build other parts of SciCap, psycho psychological capital like hope. So that is resilience. And next I'm going to talk about optimism. And also the good news is that building optimism will also help build your resilience. So being optimistic, what does that mean? It means basically having a positive attitude where you expect that you will succeed both now and in the future. So the opposite of this would be being pessimistic, which is more of a negative view where you don't expect to succeed. Now, you may have heard that people are either optimists or pessimists, but actually anyone, no matter how pessimistic they are naturally, they can actually learn how to become more optimistic. And this is one book that you can read if you wanna learn more about that. It's by Martin Seligman, Positive Psychology Pioneer. And you know, the great thing is that when you build your optimism, um, this also helps to fuel your well being as well as your work performance and your ability to overcome challenges. So, there are actually a number of ways to build optimism, but I'm just going to um, share you know, one skill with you today. And one way that you can um, become more optimistic is to practice seeing the positive. Um, things in your life or in at work. And there's actually a simple exercise that you can do. Um, and I actually recommend trying to do this every day if possible. It's called the three good things exercise. It's also known as the three blessing exercise. And what you do is um, you write down three good things that happened to you today. And it's important when you write it down that you're very detailed. You talk about what happened, but then also write you know, how did you feel when this good thing happened? And why do you think it went well? And, you know, the more that you do this each day over time, and I really encourage you to try it even just for one week um, to see if it makes a difference. Over time, it actually helps to retrain your brain to see more of the positive things in your life, which can help you become more optimistic over time. Plus, it has the added ben benefit of feeling good. So it creates positive emotions that are also very good for your well-being. So um, let's practice and I'd love to hear what is one good thing that happened to you this week and how did you feel? So if you can go to menti.com and share your one good thing with us. So what is one good thing that happened to you this week and how did it feel? And it can be, you know, anything doesn't have to be work-related. It can be um, personal. It can be um, something small. It doesn't have to be a big thing either. But just, can you, can you think of one good thing that happened to you this week? And how did it make you feel? And I'll give you a moment to, to think about it.
So can anyone think of one good thing that happened? Second dose of vaccine, excellent. Finish crocheting a sweater, wow, that's very impressive. <laughs> Laughing with your sister, that's really nice. Your time with friends is, and family is always nice. Getting a promotion, still alive, for sure. Your staff started listening to you, overcoming cabin fever. Excellent, these are great things. So yeah, again, you know, um, this exercise can be very simple. Um, just thinking about the good things that happen to you each day. And I know it can be hard. Um, you know, sometimes you may have a hard time thinking about, you know, one good thing, but chances are um, you'll find at least one good small thing that happened to you and it will help make you feel better. And over time, it will help you to develop more optimism as well, especially during challenging times like these. So another way to develop more optimism, I'm gonna give you another tool, is basically to change the story um, about what happens to you. When, so when something bad happens, you may not be aware of it, but you're creating a story about it in your head uh, to give the event meaning. And we have this natural tendency to process events in this way, to give a personal meaning to them. But the goal is to change your story from being pessimistic to being optimistic. And this is called an explanatory style. So ideally when bad things happen to you, you want to um, change your story of what you tell yourself about the event to be more optimistic. And basically the way you can do that is instead of thinking about you know, the bad event as something that will last forever, you can remember or think that it's temporary. Instead of thinking that it will affect everything, um, you can think of it as more specific to that situation. Also not taking it personally um, can also very much help you to um, be optimistic as well as um, focusing again on the things that you can control. Um, feeling that um, something is more controllable as opposed to uncontrollable will also help develop more optimism. So this takes a little time to practice, but um, you know, it's. I think the big takeaway is to just be mindful of the story you tell yourself when bad things happen. And you know, how can you how can you change that story um, to be more optimistic and more helpful for you? So that is the next tool, which is your inner hero, psychological capital. So what I want to talk about next is focused on building your positive relationships at work, which is an important social resource um, for not only effective work and better work performance, but also for your well-being. And you can build more positive work relationships by building high quality connections with your coworkers. So the quality of our connections with people at work really matters. And there are low quality connections and high quality connections. And ideally, you want to build high quality connections with the people that you work with. And these are relationships that are characterized by mutual positive regard, trust, and active engagement on both sides. And the quality of these connections can have a significant impact on people at work. So according to Jane Dutton, who's the researcher who studies high quality connections, people feel better when they experience high quality connections. They feel more energized and open and they have a higher sense of self-worth. And um, you know, having high quality connections also contributes to a higher sense of motivation, of loyalty, of commitment at work. And it also helps nourish the well-being of people at work. So having more high quality at connections at work really helps to create the energy that we need to do our best work. And this energy can be contagious where we pass it to those around us as well. So because of these benefits, I think that building positive work relationships is also a critical resource for personal capacity building. And there are actually four different ways that you can build high quality connections at work. So the first is 
respectful engagement. So engaging with others in a way that conveys your, their value or their worth. Task enabling, which is basically helping another person or a coworker to perform successfully at their work. Um, trust, trust is very important. So, you know, conveying to others that you believe in them and that they're dependable helps build qu high quality connections and also play. So participating in activities with just the goal of having fun also helps build these high quality connections. And here are just some examples or ideas of things that you can do in each of these different categories to build high quality connections. So for respectful engagement, being fully present for another person when they're speaking to you um, is one way um, to build high quality connections. Task enabling, you know, how can you, self, can you help someone else with their work? Um, is there an opportunity to share information that will help them to be successful? Trusting, you know, team building activities, um, being open and vulnerable um, can also help build trust. And then play, you know, are there ways that you can incorporate play into your meetings or your team building? And, you know, can you find time to have fun at work? And all of these things are important. And, you know, I'd say that, especially now, um, you know, I know that um, it's a time of lockdown and, you know, it's especially challenging when you're working remotely to make these high quality connections. But I would emphasize that it's especially important and critical now and to try to find ways to prioritize um, to, and to build these high quality connections with your coworkers. And, you know, in some cases you may have to be creative. You know, how can you do it online in meetings and in your interactions with people? Um, you know, what are some ways you could be respectful, um, build trust and support others in their work or be playful when you're working with each other online? So again, I just wanted to see if we could practice. Um, and if you had any ideas for what is one thing that you can do to build high quality connections at work? So I'd love to hear some of your ideas for building high quality connections. So, you know, what are some ideas you have for um, displaying respect, for helping others in their work, for building trust, or for having more fun at work with your coworkers? Saying good morning, yes, you know, that's definitely, um, you know, it, it sounds like a small thing, but even that small gesture shows that you are acknowledging the other person that you're present for them, smiling. Yep, that's also a good one. Are there any other ideas? But I think these are great ideas. Finding a game to play, that's definitely a great idea. Continuous communication and support, yes. Very important, especially now. Smiling with your eyes because the mask covers your mouth, yep. Active constructive responding, very good. Being authentic and cooperative. So these are great ideas. And as you can see, they're just simple ways that you can you know, build those positive relationships at work, which again, I think is very important. So that's high quality connections. And we just have two tools left. Um, and the next tool I'm gonna share with you is focused on supporting the well-being of staff. And this tool is called Building Blocks of Well-Being. So why is well-being important for NGO workers? So you may have heard of this saying that you can't pour from an empty cup. And, you know, I think especially during these times of COVID, well-being can be especially challenging, which is why I believe well-being needs to be an important priority, not only for capacity building, but for doing our everyday work. And that is why it's included as part of positive capacity building. You know, how can you build your capacity for well-being? And research shows that there are many benefits to focusing on your well-being. Well-being is needed for good work because your cup needs to be full in order to be able to help others. Now, so what can you do to support your well-being so that you can do your best work and also help others in the work that you do for your NGO? So I'm just gonna quickly share with you some 
some tips and ways to support and improve your well being. Um, actually, the previous webinar in the series was completely dedicated to well being, so I definitely suggest that you check out that recording. But I just want to give you a few more tools. And basically, the great news is that you can improve your well being through taking intentional actions as well as finding ways to create a more supportive environment for your well-being. And the good news is we already covered um, some actions you can take. Building your psychological cap capital um, has been very well researched and has been shown to not only help work performance, but also well-being. So I definitely encourage you to um, use those strategies to build your hope, your efficacy, your resilience, and optimism. But I'm going to give you another tool, which I'm calling building blocks of well-being. So your building blocks, um, what are they? They're basically things that research researchers have found that positively contribute to well-being. And I'm going to share with you what I mean by that. And they found that by focusing on building these building blocks, it will help you to support and improve your well being as well as your positive functioning at work. So, here's an example of building blocks. So, these are nine building blocks I wanted to just share with you to be aware of. There are actually more building blocks, but these are some of the most researched ones. And actually, we already covered some of these. We talked about positive relationships and meeting, um, we also covered accomplishment as well when we talked about self efficacy. So I actually don't have time to go in depth into all of them, but I just wanted you to be aware that prioritizing all of these things in your life will help you with your well-being. You know, having more of each of these things, like positive emotions, positive relationships, um, that will help you to improve your well-being. And, you know, maybe you feel like you have some of these, but not all of these. So in that case, you can also target specific building blocks that you feel that you need to focus on. So a good question that you can ask yourself is, you know, which building blocks are currently lacking in my life that I can focus on to improving my well-being? So I think awareness of the building blocks is the first step. And again, the good news is there are simple things you can do to build these building blocks. So here I just included a few examples that you can try. Um, and you'll notice that some of these we already covered earlier. So for example, building high quality connections, built positive relationships. Um, you know, having a sense of purpose and writing your mission statement will help you with meaning. And you know, these are just a few examples, but I think that, you know, now that you're aware of what the building blocks are, that you can probably also think of other ways that you can help improve these building blocks in your life. And by doing that, by targeting these different areas, you can help to support and improve your well being. And I suggest that it's something that you sort of monitor and check in on on a regular basis. Um, and over time, you know, hopefully you see a positive change in the way that you feel by intentionally focusing on these areas over time. So that is building blocks of well-being. And then finally, the last tool that I wanted to talk about for positive capacity building is evaluation, also referred to as program evaluation, which I think is a critical piece of capacity building because the goal of capacity building is to grow your social impact. So how will you know if you are successful in that endeavor? Um, and basically what you need to do is you need to measure your impact. And I'm going to give you just a few tips for evaluation. Um, we don't have time to go in depth. This could actually be its own webinar or a course on its own. And some of you are probably already doing um, evaluation on a regular basis at your NGO, and I think that's great. Uh, but for those of you who aren't yet, or maybe you don't know where to start, I have some um, suggestions that are hopefully helpful for you. So I think a great place to start is by clearly defining the impact um, that you're trying to create with your programs or your services. And um, I think it's also important to actually write down what these outcomes are and what you're trying to achieve um, 
both in the short, medium, and long term. And the key is to define outcomes that are very specific and measurable so that you can easily measure and track to know whether you've achieved them or not. And you know, to do this exercise, I actually recommend starting with trying to identify and articulate your long-term outcomes. You can think of that as sort of like your North Star of what your NGO is trying to achieve in the long-term, you know, the ultimate outcome that you want to achieve for your beneficiaries or for your community, for example. And then you can work backwards to define what those outcomes could look like in the medium and short term. And ideally, you're also very specific about when um, you expect to achieve these outcomes so that you know when to measure them as well. So that's defining your impact. And then once you have your outcomes defined, you can also, I also recommend documenting exactly how do you plan to achieve those outcomes. So what are you doing as an NGO or as a program that will get you there? And this includes three things. It includes the resources that you need to operate your program. It includes the activities, the actual activities that your program does that are designed to lead to those outcomes. And then also it should include what data can you monitor to track and to know that you have actually um, delivered your program successfully. So for example, um, you know, tracking participation rates um, will help you know that you um, actually successfully reached a certain number of people and delivered your program. And then when you put these things together, um, this forms what is called a logic model. And some of you may be familiar, already have a logic mo model. And if you don't, I highly recommend um, creating one because it's a very useful tool for program design and program evaluation. And you can see that it includes both process, you know, the things that you're doing to create the impact you want to create, as well as the impact that's um, defined in terms of short, medium, and long-term outcomes. And once you have all of these things defined, you can actually evaluate both. And for example, if you want to evaluate process, you can get feedback from participants. You know, did the, pro did the activities go well? Did the program go well? Um, so it can help you think about whether you need to make improvements. And you can also determine what data do you need to collect to measure your outcomes. Um, and often starting with the short term is the easiest place to start. And this is um, kind of a great starting point um, to help you start planning for and thinking about measuring your social impact. So again, I didn't have time to go in depth about this, but I just wanted to kind of highlight this as an important tool. And this is actually a great resource. It's a free um, guide that you can download from the Kellogg Foundation that goes very in detail about how to create a program logic model. And it's free. And it also includes some examples in there as well that will be helpful. So now we have all six tools. We've covered all six tools for positive capacity building. I know we covered a lot, but you know, I hope that you walk away with at least one or two ideas of how you can get started to build the capacity of your NGO and to also build your own capacity to support your well-being and to do good work. So I hope that the webinar inspired you to take action and I hope you take action right away by trying one of the exercises. And you know, to start, once you start building your strengths and your resources, the, again, the idea is that over time, um, with positive capacity building, you can improve your organization's effectiveness while supporting staff well-being and work performance in order to achieve greater impact in the future that is sustainable over the long term. So, what I shared with you today is actually from a chapter that I wrote, um, and from this book that was recently published. And in the book, I describe a more structured process for positive capacity building that requires more of like a hands-on facilitation from an expert, especially for an NGO that's going through it for the first time. But what I wanted to do with you, for you today in this webinar was to pull out you know, the ingredients of positive capacity building to simplify things so that you can walk away with some tools that are easy for you to use on your own right away. But if you're interested in learning more um, about this, I'd be happy to share my book chapter with you. So thank you very much for having me today. And 
Um, you know, if you want to get in touch with me, the easiest way to connect would be by going to my website. Um, and here you can get in touch with me and you can send me a message. Um, and, you know, if you're interested in the book chapter or if you'd like me to send you the PowerPoint, I'd be happy to do that. Um, you know, just write me a message and let me know. And of course, this session is also being recorded for you as well so that you can view it later on through Positive Workplaces. But thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much, Vicky. I learned so much from today's webinar. Like for instance, okay. I, I personally have been going through like, a, oh gosh, we've been in this lockdown. I mean, semi lockdown sort of, we've been in the pandemic for so long and what, what, what can we do to improve our situation in our organizations and in our lives. And I just took so much notes from everything that you've shared today that I'm super excited to try. So for everyone, if you have questions for Vicky, this is a perfect time. She's been so generous sharing all of that with us and staying with us to answer some of your questions. You can type your question in the chat box, or if you'd like to be anonymous, you can also scan the QR code that is on the screen and click on the link that is um, we posted in the chat box. But I just want to say, Vicky, a lot of people are um, flooding the chat box with th saying thank you and that oh, they learned great. a lot from your webinar and that it was um, very informative. It They really enjoyed it. Uh, Juri said, I love today's webinar. I enjoyed it and it wasn't boring. So thanks so much for making that such a fun process. Oh, good. I'm so uh, glad it wasn't boring. Well, um, I, I'm so happy. You know, the goal is really to make it helpful for you. So I'm really glad that it, it's helpful. So thank you. Yeah, and Jesse also said that really was an amazing presentation, so much valuable and what well organized information. And I just really want to echo what Jesse said. You, you, when we're looking for interventions, you might find like pieces of it around, but the way that you just stitched all of that so beautifully, it's it's such a meaningful learning experience because of how you curated it. So thanks so much for that. Oh, good. I'm really glad. This is very great feedback for me and I feel very encouraged. I think my self-efficacy for webinars has gone up. So I really appreciate it. And again, I'm really glad that you enjoyed the webinar. Yeah, so while we're waiting for questions, oh, we have one question here. Okay, somebody asked, hi, Vicky. Can you, Swen asks, hi, Vicky, can you share the most challenging experience for you in your workplace and how were you able to overcome such? Oh, this is a good question. <laughs> okay, I have to think about it for a while. You know, I've, I've been working for um, almost 18 years now and there's definitely been a lot of crazy things that have happened um, and challenges that I've experienced. So um, I'm trying to think of... Um, a good example. Um, let's see. Challenging experience in my workplace. Well, you know, I think um, thinking about the work that I do now, um, which is research and consulting work, um, and especially during COVID, because we were also in lockdown for a while. Luckily, it's opening up a bit. You know, during that time when we were in lockdown, um, you know, I was pretty much working on my own on a lot of things. I was working alone. Um, and I found that it was quite challenging for me sometimes to feel motivated. Um, and I definitely felt like I experienced the loss of energy, um, which was really, um, stressful for me because I had so much work I needed to do, writing and research and all of those things. So what I did um, was I really made a point to try to reach out to people, even if I couldn't see them in person, um, to connect online, you know, to talk to my family online because I, I wasn't able to visit them, um, and to also um, talk to other people in my PhD program. Um, and, you know, I found that doing that was really energizing. And I also try to find um, projects to work on where I'm not working on a working alone, I'm working with other people. Um, so that's one recent challenge that I think um, I experienced and maybe you can relate to. Um, and I think those those social connections really helped me a lot during that time. 
because social support, again, is a big um, protective factor that helps with resilience. And a good motivation, I should mention as well, and well-being. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much for sharing your personal experience on that one, Vicky. My my question is, among the six tools that you've shared, which one is your favorite and why? Oh, that is also a good question. My favorite tools. You know, I think that it's hard to pick a favorite, to be honest, it's like picking a child. And I think they're all <laughs> important. Um, but I think something um, that really comes to mind for me is um, psychological capital. Um, you know, I wasn't familiar with um, psychological capital um, before I started my PhD program. And, you know, I, I, I feel that, you know, I didn't even know it was possible to become more optimistic or to build resilience, to, you know, to be more hopeful. Um, and when I learned about these tools, um, I've been using them myself. And um, it was really transformative for me in terms of, um, you know, being able to do my work and to feel my work. And I think what's nice about psychological capital is that there's so much research behind it. Um, across different cultures about how it helps with well-being and with work performance and the strategies. And we only covered a few of the strategies today. There are actually more that you can look into. Um, the strategies for building all of those things, the hope, the confidence, self-efficacy, the resilience and optimism can actually be quite simple and they're easy to implement day to day. It's not like you have to do this big thing. It's quite easy once you get the hang of it to make it more of a habit and to incorporate it into your life so that's something that's helped me personally yeah yeah I love that one too thanks for sharing that with all of us um let's see let let us know if anyone else has any more questions for Vicky we can actually take a few more minutes to take to answer some questions and yeah just as Vicky said we're actually um, this is already being live streamed on our YouTube page. So if you want to catch the recording again after this, you can just go over to our YouTube page, youtube.com slash positive workplaces, and you'll see the recording there. Um, let us know if you have any more questions. And if there's none, um, yeah, I just like to take this opportunity again to thank Vicky. Like she spent so much time to, to, you know, meet with us and design this for us and really like squeeze in the best information given the wisdom that she's gained from over like 18 years of working and also from her expertise in studying positive psychology. So I'm super grateful, Vicky. Thank you so much for that one. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you so much to Vicky and to everyone for attending. Um, if you want to support our community, you know, we're always doing these three free webinars every month. Please follow us on facebook.com slash positive workplaces ph. And if you can share that with your friends so that they can also catch the new things that we're bringing, to, bringing for the community, we'd really appreciate that. And next for our webinar series in the next month where it's, it's National Mental Health Month, we have uh, a webinar on championing the well-being and mental health in the workplace, st starting off with Alan Gattenby and then followed by Gabby Yamzon and also someone you, maybe some of you are familiar with, Gio Kapinpin. And again, we are on YouTube. So if you want to catch a recording of this, just go to youtube.com slash positive workplaces. We're also created a course on organizational well-being. So if you'd like to join us, um, please, um, please check out our Facebook page. We have more details on that. Let's champion well-being in the workplace by empowering your leaders to become well-being champions. And so now we're going to be posting the post-evaluation link in the chat box. Please answer this within 30 minutes so that you can claim your e-certificate. And... Yeah, so Vicky, a lot of people still saying lots of thanks in the chat box. Um, is there anything you'd like to say to everyone before we officially close? 
Well, I just want to say thank you to everyone for attending this webinar today. I'm glad that you found it helpful and valuable, and I, I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, I'm really, I really hope it's helpful for you because I think the work that you do is so important, and I know it can be challenging. So I hope you have some, some takeaways that you're able to do to support your well-being and to be able to do your best work. And thank you, Nikki and Positive Workplaces, for hosting me today as well to be able to share with everyone. Thanks so much, Vicky. And again, like what Vicky said, we admire so much the work that the NGO workers in this room are doing. These are tough times, but you're doing a lot of good for the whole world and for our country. So thank you so much, everyone. Please have a good day ahead and we will catch you in our future webinars. Thank you. Bye, everyone.